I do. So you'll probably just stand here since it makes it easier for the cameras. Okay. And then I need someone. Let me go test the. Let me go test the audience. Well, you're going to make sure you get that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the same lady as one. It is. <laughs> You know, I'm right here. Is Sarah Ramos? It is. And what's funny is I didn't realize this last time, but I used to work with her husband in the hospital. Oh, really? Yeah. Ramos. Are you going to? Can you hear me, test test? Uh, I, I would start with Mike Wong and make the way down. Okay. Testing, nope. <laughs> Testing, nope. Yeah, this only okay. one chair is like there's no rules. You can sit there, yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be weird though, like behind. Well, you can move around. You don't have to be videoed the whole time. I do because there there's people taking the class on video. Oh okay. that's the whole yeah, that's the whole point of the video. <laughs> is there's people taking so the class on the video. I, I probably should get back, get back. You can walk back and go right Get back. <laughs> To know what my parameters are so I can go to about there here. stop <laughs> here is as far as I can that's go. where you can see all of you I would say that desk is probably your test test can you hear me I can hey okay good once you get to the desk you're starting to disappear don't so stay behind the desk stay behind the desk oh, <laughs> <laughs> Start away. I want to be like my name. Yes. Hey, my name's Jen Hamlin. I'm naked from the waist down. How do you be winning? 31 to 14. And lose. So we were watching or we had recorded the game. Yeah, I started calling to my job. Well, I'm glad that we recorded it because I was able to go tell him. We lose this game in overtime. Okay. But I don't know if this made it better or worse because the whole time he's like, how do, how do, how did we lose this game? How, and then the wheels started coming off. He's like, oh, okay. Um we went from being you know nationally ranked to being ranked seven in the big 12, <laughs> including behind Texas Tech. And Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Baylor. I think, oh, in Kansas and Kansas State. I think we're ahead of Iowa State. <laughs> and I believe that's all. Is it normal view? Is that what it is? Yes, it's normal view. Not a very good picture. The lighting is very interesting. Maybe that's what it yes. Is. The light above you. Yes. Let's see if we can go around. Well, not all of the lights are on. No, you need to take that off. Oh. <laughs> Your face is shining. It's not perfect. Yep. Can you see you? Yep, there I am. That one still came on. Is it still washed out? Okay, what if we did that? That one's not bad. That one's not bad. Yeah, see, so you show up a lot better. Yeah. I have, Much better. I have color. <laughs> she won't mind, will she? I don't think so. All right, so. I'm wondering how I can. Well, could just be taller. No, and I'm in heels too. Like, mm -mm. Hello. Oh, did you get it? I did. I had a minor meltdown two days ago when I was going over it. 
because it was just one of those things where I pulled it up on a different computer, so it reformatted, and I'm like, ah! Oh, but I just wanted nice. to make sure, it I don't care if the effects work, just so long as the information is there. That's my biggest, yeah. So it's there now, you close up like your PowerPoint, it's not showing on my side. I, oh, oh, did, yes, I, I did. Oh, that's okay. Yes. Hi, right. right. Meryl. Okay. Oh, well, it's I'm nice here to thank you. you. Yes. My husband does hi. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my we didn't get to really yeah. talk that much. Yeah. I can't remember anything from day to day anymore. Oh, we can jab with it. Hello. They can hear y'all too. Oh, yeah. Don't put one on his table. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Is it automatically? Or I wouldn't you put one on his table. Okay, yeah, I probably don't want to put one. <laughs> um, if you talk in the background, though, you have to have it because that's the number one complaint of people out in Zimland is they can't hear. Yeah. Well, it's just it. I don't really want them. To okay. Hear. She's making the presentation. Okay. I'm security. Yeah. <laughs> right. Here's the support group. Like the football team knew they are football team. Yeah. That was kind of blue. So we Raymond was really outspoken about it. I'm so sure he was. <laughs> we uh we lived in Lubbock for 35 years and neither one of us went to look to a tech, but my daughter went there and I taught at tech for a while. So I mean, you know, just living in the community, you kind of you know, you root for the home team. Yeah, I mean, we, couldn't be, we couldn't be driving to it, but but we, I went to UT, I went to U of H. But so anyway, that game is always, you know, who do I, who do I root for, you know? Yeah. But I was kind of glad that Tech won because it's probably their last, their last. Um, who were all of us. At least at home. Yeah, because they probably won't be playing. Their too. best friends are right now. Uh, yes. And so they're always pranking each other. Yeah. I think the cutest one though is when they took, their uh, pug and he's a veterinarian. They took the pug into the veterinarian, and, and you know they put her to sleep. And we, were, I was with Aaron when we picked up the dog. We were going home, and the dog was asleep. And it turned out they carved A and M on her chest. Oh, they shaved it. Shaved. You hear stories about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You're lucky. You I love you because I can't believe you did we, that to my dog. I was embarrassed though. That um, about that incident afterwards. Yes. I hate the tortillas. I just hate them. Yes. I hated them when I saw them there when we moved there. And uh, I don't. I don't know. even get it. What is it? I, I don't even know. I I don't know. The yeah, worst thing is started. that stand and knocked over. The, That's what she's yeah. talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That there's no excuse for that. But You're then on the other hand, you blame the whole school because of one jerk. I know. Mm -hmm. But on the they other will. hand, my daughter. The cheerleader for Tech, and they played um, Texas in Austin the year she was cheering. And when they were, I assume Tech lost. I can't remember. Probably, but anyway, when they were walking oh. back to get into their vehicles or the bus, or they, they said that the Texas fans are just as raucous to them as the Tech is to them. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's just. Being yes, I it's just a game, fun. and you take all the fun out of it when you act that way. I don't. It, it's, it's sillier and sillier. Yes, it's okay to cheer. Yeah. So you're good now. I believe I'm good. The only thing that I don't know is, no, I'm good, because I was like, oh wait, but nope, it's right there. It should say Jen Freeman, shouldn't it? No, you did. It does on my diploma. Do you want me to uh, hyphenate my name? No. no, I have to get one of those stamp things because I would sure as heck don't want to sign it over and over and over again. How are you? Hi, I'm Beryl. I'm Beryl. I'm Carolyn Maxfield. Oh, good to meet you. Hi, I think I've met you before. Yeah. Beryl. This didn't print out correctly, so I'm related to Maxfield. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Ours is L B I L. Oh, which is a little right? Yeah, I got you, Carolyn. Yeah, these were DAO. It didn't print correctly, so I'm just checking y'all. Okay. So I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure when you speak, speak into the microphone so the people out in Zoom land can hear you. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so you might be the price of network. Yeah. A Merrill or rents from the service loop. Yeah, you and I are talking to each other. Let me just stay in busy, busy over there, aren't you? Yes. Kevin just gets up into more and more things. There's that. I agree to you, President, but I don't agree to all the other stuff you said. I would be lucky if I stay. Why don't you ever tell you all the other stuff? Oh, yeah, I guess I could do that. Still seven, seven minutes. minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> I gotta go back home. We'll be right back. I don't know. I don't teach behind a desk. I would not have brought heels. I'd have done flats. Yeah, right. No, you need to do stilettos. I know. Yeah. They didn't do really well. Get over the. Yeah. 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 Okay, Jan, what are all those letters by your name? <laughs> master of uh, Master of Science, yes. Yeah. I have a Master of Science um, in Family and Consumer Sciences, and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. It used to be just registered dietitian, right. but because so many people were claiming to be nutritionists, the Academy of Dietetics actually took them to court. So to claim that that title and subsequently I now have a, an extra letter yeah. that I always forget because I always do register registered dietitian, but it's registered dietitian, nutritionist, and then licensed dietitian. But I get in trouble for saying you're a nutritionist. You do, yes. I would think that you would remember what your money paid for for my degree. <laughs> yes. I mean, you check your stuff off. That was like a hundred years ago. It was. It's so quiet. I wish they had like some, just even some elevator music, some nice piano music, something. Wait, 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 what do you want? No, no. I'll fire up some Pandora. Right. Patty, Carolyn, how do you feel? I can't meet you a couple of times. Yeah. I love your top. Oh, thank you. Too rare. Yeah, I like it. Well, how is it? Uh, well, they're, they're, they're training a couple of giraffes. Oh. They've gotten some giraffes. So, go ahead, giraffe. Barbara promised to bring their brochure, but I don't see it yet. Did, did they have them? Did you have them? Uh, did you see the giraffes when you were there? Oh, they're in. They're both their feet. Okay. <laughs> and they're getting charges too. I'm trying to get uh, my tour guide association to go. And uh, I think, you know, they could probably get a number of us, maybe 10 or 15, that they might give us a special. Yeah, because it's $25. Yeah, it was 100 when we went. And I saw that it's gone up since then. Yeah. I'm going to give uh, a couple of. I guess we just get to a cup of tea for Christmas present. Oh, that's a nice Christmas present. Yeah. And, and so about how much time did they spend with you? An hour and a half. They start right on time. And uh, we were through, we started at 11. The grounds don't open until 1030, so there's no going in and walking around. But it is beautifully groomed. The grounds are all good parking, good restroom facilities, and so even for folks who have trouble walking. <laughs> yes, yes, but you don't walk. Much. No, you don't walk. It's all right there. Yeah, I mean several buildings, but all uh, right there. Yeah, it's it's good. We're talking about the Elephant Reserve. Oh, okay. I haven't been to that here. Where is it? Between, between Stonewall and Fredericksburg? Uh, between actually, it's at Stonewall. Yeah. Between Stonewall, do you know that uh, road to Sandy that's between here and Johnson City? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I passed I think it. it's 13 something. Her kids have run track in Johnson City, so I don't think that one. Okay. We, 
we turned right there. We we went down through the country and then we came back through Stonewall and Johnson City. I love that. Please don't tell me that you're power on our screen. I love it right there. But it's okay. good here. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, on, it's on that one. I don't mean so much. But so I would be fascinated by this. Yeah. Uh, and it's very informative. It tells you the plight of the elephant, both in Africa and Asia. They they lecture their lectures are really good. Can you tell me about this? Oh, it's up. That's okay. What is this now? Why don't you tell me about the elephant preserve? The elephant preserve in Fredericksburg. Uh, it's in the packet outside of Fredericksburg. that I gave you. Yes. yes. Yeah. Which package? Let me see. Yeah. We'll get him another catalog. I know. <laughs> the Texas Tech package? Yes. Oh, I didn't see that. It's in there. Oh, I did it for you. Oh, you mind. Yes. Yeah. No, I have I have your I've check. Been, Let me go get it. I'll come right back. All right. I'll make sure everything's good. Yeah. Yes. yes. I thought I was very interested. Yeah, you need to go through this group because it's $125 if you go on your own. <laughs> To the elephant person? Yeah. Well, that's what you didn't tell me about. No, I, <laughs> I gave there. you the catalog. So through here, you know. It's Are just, you all related? That's my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you tell? Well, I know, I, I know who you look kind of Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, that's my daddy. I don't think they were charging that much if you went to the. Yeah, oh no. The Ollie group. Yeah, no, it was just $25. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you I would pay that. Yeah. But it's it well worth the trip. Oh, I don't have to walk though. Meryl. Yeah, no, not much at all. I'm excited about uh, the neighborhood. Oh, good, good, good. All right. Yeah, I've got so that. Here. Yeah. 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 I'll talk to you. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> that one right Thank you for doing that. No problem. I got one minute. Did she was she able to pull up the slides on the Zoom? I guess she did. I think it wasn't shared, whatever that means. So. Okay. Did everybody get a microphone? You have a microphone? <clears throat> okay. It's just if you ask a question, because there's people that are on, on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, you push it if you want to talk. Yeah. Yeah. You can't turn it off. Just push. <laughs> That's why I don't have yeah, I'm not planning on talking. Okay. If you're okay. I think Sarah has said that uh, if you don't have yeah, we have one thing, it just. Uh... Good morning. Yeah. I don't know which way to look. <laughs> just look at, like you're at a classroom. You yes. need to look that way. Okay. All right. We ready to. He looks a lot bigger. Sarah will tell you. Yes. Time to start. Okay. Ted, can you hear us? Yes. Can you just let me know. I'll just check in for the Zoom. I know the classroom can hear me. Can you hear me on Zoom? Thumbs up. I can hear her, but not. Yeah, yet. she's asking if the gentleman with the earphones can hear her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. No. No, I, I can. I can <laughs> okay, you can hear us now. Yeah, I can. I, I, who's? Oh, let me see. Who's your Sarah Ramos? Is okay. Uh, you're. You're. Are you in Lubbock, Sarah? No, I'm here in Highland Lakes. In Highland Lubbock. Lakes. Uh huh. Who's the lady in Highland Lakes? That's me, Sarah. And then you should see the lady in Highland. What oh, else? You okay? Okay. Yeah, that's the dietitian that's here. That's Jen Hamblin. Oh, okay. That's Jen. That's. Jen is waving her hand. Yes. Okay. So she's going to be the one doing all the speaking today, but I just wanted to make sure that you could hear. And Ted, I'm going to keep you on mute, but if you have anything to say, just unmute yourself or feel free to type it in the chat box. Technology is great until it isn't. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we get started? Are we good to start, Sarah? Yes. Yes. For a reminder for the classroom, please use your microphones if you talk. Do you have one? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. And we don't have to push it right. No. Let's right. on. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Hey, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Oh. We did talking. 
question. Is this, uh, can you folks hear me? Yes. Uh, will this uh, presentation be recorded? Yes, it will. It would be accessible by us after the session's over with? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, well, yes. Okay. That they'll email that we can email it out to you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so um, this class is for diabetes, prediabetes, and carb counting. So if that's not what you signed up for, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> um, uh -oh. There it goes. Um, my name is Jen Hamblin. Um, I am a registered dietitian and I'm licensed to practice in the state of Texas. I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, which really stings after last week. <laughs> we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Texas. I got my master's degree from a little university in Beaumont called Lamar University. And that's where I also did my dietetic internship. And the reason why I'm telling you all this is to differentiate what a dietitian is versus anybody who says that they know nutrition knowledge. I do have a master's degree in nutrition. And in order to become a registered dietitian, you have to do over a thousand clinical hours in the different fields of dietetics, whether it's clinical, um, food service, or community nutrition. And then we have to take a really hard test. Um, and then every five years, I have the option of taking the test again, which would be a nightmare, or I can do continuing education credits. And that's how I keep up with my license and registration and keep up with the um, research and, and um, making sure that every, all the information that I present to you guys is accurate. Um, I'm also married. And those are my two monsters right there. Um, Tyler is 15 and Savannah is 12. They are eating ice cream to prove that I am not the food police. That's the other thing I get accused of all the time is, oh, you're going to tell me all the things that I can't eat. No, that's not my intention at all. My intention is to educate people about food and make sure everybody has a healthy and positive relationship with food, regardless of your diagnoses. So today we're going to do a deep dive into diabetes, pre-diabetes, and how we can have a positive uh, relationship with food while dealing with um, those diagnoses, or if you're a caretaker of someone with one of those diagnoses. I did want to put out the um, disclaimer that this is purely meant to be educational and should not be used to self-diagnose or treat any sort of medical ailments that you think you might have. Please seek treatment from a professional um, endocrinologist or your primary care um, physician. But this is good information. Um, if you've never heard of anything as far as a diabetic diet goes, this is a good place to start. Okay. So what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about diabetes and its different variations, how we diagnose it. Um, sorry, I gotta keep up my other slides. How we diagnose it, what are some common issues that are associated with it, so why it's important to manage it. And then the big um, hot ticket item is a carbohydrate. What is it, how do we count it, and how does it play into managing our diabetes? And then how do we use it on day-to-day -day things to include snacking, eating out, and drinking? Trying to manage two slides at the same time. <laughs> so first let's go into what is diabetes. So diabetes is defined as, oops, I'm gonna get it, I promise. Di diabetes is defined as a disease in which the body's ability to produce or respond to a hormone insulin is impaired, resulting in a normal metabolism of carbohydrates and elevated levels of glucose in the blood or urine. Layman's terms is you have too much sugar in your blood. That's what diabetes is. And we do have four different classifications for the diabetes, um, and I'll go into that in, for just, in just a second. But I just want to make sure that every, if there's no questions regarding insulin. Because that's, I know that word's getting thrown around a lot and some people know what it is and some people don't. So insulin is a hormone that's produced by your pancreas um, and it aids in getting glucose into the cells for energy and regeneration purposes. So if you look at my little diagram on there, insulin is the key. <clears throat> so, to, um, so you have the little sugar cells and the, the insulin with being the key is what gets the little sugar cells to where they need to go. So that's really the issue with diabetes um, is that's how we classify the different types of diabetes. So there's four different types of diabetes. There's type one, type two, pre-diabetes, and gestational diabetes. With type one, your body doesn't make the key at all. 
So you have to take insulin with the injections. That's the difference between um, type one. That's what sets type one out from everybody else. <laughs> type two, there's actually two variations of type two. And it's your body either doesn't make enough insulin or there's some hindrance that's causing the insulin to not get to where it needs to go. Usually it's um, fat cells getting in the way. But again, it just has to do with that key and that you're not making enough keys or the key has a lot of obstacles that it has to go to before it can get to the cell that it needs to go to. And that would be type two diabetes. Pre-diabetes, you're not a type one, you're not a type two, but you still have quite a bit of sugar in your blood and you're kind of on the pathway to one of those diagnoses. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good place to start if we hear start hearing the words from our doctor, hey, it's looking at you might be a pre-diabetic to really take the diet changes to heart because we could reverse that. Um, and then finally, gestational diabetes. This is for all the ladies out there. Gestational diabetes is what happens when you're pregnant. Um, it's usually just high blood sugar levels during pregnancy. It typically resolves after birth, but it does make you predisposition to get type two diabetes later on. So it's something that constantly has to be monitored. For the sake of this class, we're really just gonna focus in on type two and prediabetes. So how is it diagnosed? How do we diagnose diabetes? Well, we do a blood test. Um, and there's a couple of blood tests that we do. We do fasting blood uh, plasma glucose. And that's what your doctor does when they say you have to have blood work done. Go to the lab. Don't drink coffee. Don't eat breakfast. And we're going to test your blood, uh, your blood levels. One of the things that we're testing is glucose. Um, the other one is a ra random plasma glucose. This one's not fasting. So this is just, we had the afternoon appointment instead of the morning appointment with the lab. Um, and again, we'll test your glucose that way. The oral glucose tolerance test, this is what we give um, our mamas back in the day when we were having our babies and we had to drink that sugar juice to see if we were a diabetic while we were pregnant. That's what this test is, um, is they make mama shotgun, basically Kool-Aid, and then see how their body processes that high dose of sugar. So that's that test. And then lastly, it's A1C. Um, A1C is what I like to call your um, diabetes report card. We're going to go into that more in just a second. But those are the three, or excuse me, the four blood tests or four tests that we use to test for diabetes. There's also a family history. If you have a family history, if you come to me and say, I've been dosed with di uh, diabetes, that's probably the first question I'm going to ask you. Do you have a family history of it? Because um, a lot of times it happens to people who are like, I thought I was eating right. I was working out. You know, I've been healthy as a horse all this time. I don't understand why all of a sudden I have prediabetes. A lot of genetics, there's nothing we can do about genetics. Um, I'm never going to dunk a basketball. I will constantly be four feet or five feet tall. I'm fine with that. Diabetes is kind of the same thing if there's a family history of it. There's also signs and symptoms that we can look for or we're already aware of. Um, you're always tired, always hungry, always thirsty is a big one. It just seems like you just cannot quench your thirst. That's a big sign of diabetes. And then, of course, subsequently using the bathroom quite often because you're thirsty all the time. Blurry vision, sudden weight loss, the tingling in the hands um, or your feet and then non-healing wounds. And I'm gonna go into more detail as to why we would have those signs and symptoms, but those are pretty general signs and symptoms of diabetes, okay? So understanding your A1C, it's called glyconated hemoglobin, but we're gonna go with A1C because that's easier to say. <laughs> But like I said, I lovingly refer to your A1C as your diabetes report card. And what it is, is I'm sure you've seen people that have diagnosed with diabetes are doing finger sticks. An A1C would be an average two to three months of those finger stick levels. And with that number is how we diagnose your, if you are in fact diabetic and then how well controlled it is. So these numbers, I do need to preface our Baylor Scott and White numbers. Seton might have different numbers, but just for comparison's sake, or just to kind of give you an idea, um, these are the Baylor Scott and White numbers that we would use to diagnose diabetes. If your A1C is 5.6 or less, um, there's no signs, you're, you're sitting pretty, there's no signs of prediabetes or diabetes. 5.7 to 6.4, actually Baylor Scott and White at 6.3 um, is considered prediabetic. 
Um, and then 6.4, again, Baylor, Scott and White or more is considered diabetic. And if you look to the chart that's on the right, it'll show you if your A1C comes back um, within the normal level, so the five, the six, or the seven, that means if we were to prick your finger, that's probably what your glucose or your blood sugar level would be at, somewhere between the 97 to the 154, which would be considered normal. Um, if you were trending more towards the seven, we would want to do a fasting glucose on you to see if maybe there's some pre-diabetes because that is still high. Um, but we want to, you know, find out, is that an anomaly or is this a normal thing? And that's where the A1C comes in. Okay. Um, anything that's when your A1C is in double digits, we would consider that uncontrolled diabetes. And this is where we're talking about medication and possibly in oral medication and then possibly insulin as well, just to help get those numbers back down. When you've been diagnosed with diabetes, our goal is to get your A1C at seven or lower. Okay. So moving on, common problems with diabetes. Like I said, I mentioned those signs and symptoms earlier, so we're going to dive into those a little bit more. High blood pressure and high cholesterol um, is a common side effect of diabetes, um, which puts you at a risk for stroke or heart attacks. Kidney damage, so a risk of nephropathy. Um, peripheral vascular disease, or PVD. It's a damage to the blood vessels, to the legs and the feet. Um, we also notice that it takes a longer time for cuts and sores to heal. Um, and the reason why these things are, well, actually, let me go through them all and then I'll explain why. Retinopathy um, is eye damage that can be caused by either high blood pressure or high blood sugar, both of which can be associated with diabetes. Um, gum disease and cavities, your high blood sugar makes your gums weaker, which of course snowballs into loose teeth, bleeding gums, cavities, and then bad breath. And then finally, neuropathy, which is nerve damage caused by the high blood sugar. Um, high blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol damages blood vessels to the brain and the heart. Um, and what I want you to picture as far as diabetes goes is, um, again, we're talking about diabetes being sugar in your blood. So if that sugar stays there, it actually thickens your blood. So I want you to think of your blood going from a consistency to water to syrup. And just think about the damage that, that would do, even just in regular, like your pipes at home, just with plumbing, with water versus syrup going down there. Of course, it's going to cause some damage to your piping. Same thing within our bodies with our blood vessels. That sticky consistency, that thick consistency can really wreak havoc on our blood vessels and cause some long-term damage. Okay. Really hard managing too. No, nope, that's not the right one. I'm missing a slide. Okay, I'm missing a slide. So I'll just go over it verbally. And it's talking about how we manage diabetes. And I'm going to talk about that before we jump into the carbohydrates. But how do we manage diabetes? Okay, we've been diagnosed. So what happens now? Well, once we get the diagnosis of diabetes, we'll talk about the severity of it. And that's where the A1C comes in. And that's where we kind of sort of plan our attack of how are we going to manage this new diagnosis. The first thing would be medications, oral medications with type 2 and prediabetes is the first thing that we're going to go to. They help manage blood sugar sugar levels. Um, they keep our liver from releasing too much sugar while we're sleeping. That's part of metabolism. That's the other reason why we like to test your blood sugar fasting before you've eaten anything is our livers make sugar while we're sleeping. There's nothing you can do about it. Everybody does it. Um, but if we're a diabetic, it's still sugar in our system that our body's not processing the way it should. So the medication can help regulate how much sugar our liver is making while we're sleeping as well. Um, it helps the pancreas to release more insulin or more keys, so to speak, to help manage that blood sugar level. Um, it helps the muscles or the cells receive those keys better than they are. Um, and then it, we, a lot of them just basically mimic the insulin. Um, and then lastly, as far as medication goes, would be the insulin injections. Everyone, when they come to see me, they're like, tell me what I can do to just stay off the insulin injections because I don't want to do the insulin injections. And again, 
it's good to have them. It's better than nothing as far as management goes. And yes, diet can help, but sometimes insulin injection is just the only option that we have. If your body's not making something, we have to give the insulin injections to substitute it for that thing that it's not making. Exercise is very helpful as well. 30 minutes every day is what I like to recommend for my patients because exercise is our body's natural way of bringing down that blood sugar as well. Um, I always say mix it up between cardio and muscle, muscle strengthening on top of all of the benefits with exercise. Again, it's a body's natural way of bringing that blood sugar down because it's using all of that sugar for energy. Um, and then there's the dietary changes and that's where I come in. Um, for the dietary changes, you're going to want to be able to identify what a carbohydrate is so you can count them to make sure that you're not overdoing it or underdoing it throughout the day. You want to eat consistently throughout the day. You'd be surprised how often when you come to see me, how often I'm telling you you need to eat throughout the day to help keep a nice steady blood sugar level. Don't want to skip meals. That's a big one for sure. We get busy. Stuff happens. I get it. We have to plan for it, though. We can't just skip a meal. Um, so that's where making a meal plan really comes in handy, making sure that it's including whole grains, fruits and vegetables, lean, low-fat protein sources. You want to limit that salt intake just overall because it helps keep the blood pressure low. Um, um, and then finally, reading nutrition labels. So I apologize for not having that slide in there. I don't know why it was missing, but that's what you were missing. <laughs> okay, so now we're moving on to the carbohydrates. We do have a question um, regarding exercise. How about one hour every two days? One hour every two days? <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Just so long, I, I want to say it's like 150 minutes a week or something. And I'm like, that just seems like a lot of math. It seemed a lot easier to just tell people 30 minutes a day. But however you want to break that up, the biggest thing that I would say that I would recommend is to make sure that we're alternating between cardio and muscle strength training. Cardio obviously keeps our heart nice and healthy. It helps with the blood flow. Muscle strengthening helps with mobility. It helps with muscle retention. Once you hit about 50 to 60, your muscles just start to deteriorate. There's nothing that you can do about that, but you can do muscle strength training to help hang on to what you have. So I really, really stress alternating between the cardio and the um, muscle strength training. Okay, so moving on to carbohydrates. What is a carbohydrate? A carbohydrate is an organic compound and occurs in food, including sugars, starch, and cellulose. It's broken down into glucose. It's the main source of energy for cells, tissues, and organs. It's one of your three macronutrients. Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are considered your three macronutrients. It is not the source of all of your problems. It seems like every diet, the first thing they say is, well, it's probably too much carbohydrate. Maybe it is, uh, but that doesn't mean eliminate it completely. And here's why. Carbohydrates is our body's preferred form of fuel. I always like to compare our bodies and carbohydrates to a car and gasoline. Um, carbohydrates, like our body's gasoline, it's what get our motor running. Can cars run off of other things besides gasoline? Yes, our bodies can run off of other things besides carbohydrates. But for optimal performance, the ideal way of fueling our bodies is to make sure that we're taking in carbohydrates. So the best way to do that is know what a carbohydrate is. And this is where I blow everyone's mind because carbohydrate goes beyond breads, pastas and cereals. Your fruits and your fruit juices are going to have carbohydrates in it. Your milk and your yogurts are going to have carbohydrates in it. And then of course your cereals, grains, pastas, bread, and crackers. Some of your vegetables are going to have carbohydrates in them. And then your beans, peas, and lentils will all have carbohydrates in them. If you're a science buff and you know the word or the, the ending of the word O-S-E, that's chemistry for sugar, glucose, fructose, that's the sugar that's in fruit, um, lactose, that's the sugar that's in milk. All of those things, your body doesn't care what it starts with, it turns it into glucose. O-S-E means sugar, okay? And then lastly, a source of carbohydrates or a source of glucose anyway, is your liver. As I discussed, while we're sleeping, our liver, um, that's just part of metabolism, our liver makes glucose while we're sleeping. So those are our sources of carbohydrates. what do we do with this information? Well, we count our carbohydrates. Um, 
actually, yeah, that came out pretty good. I will do the best that I can. I want to point so bad, but I have to stay on camera, but I want to point so bad. Um, this is how we count our carbohydrates. Um, and this is how we make what I call your carbohydrate budget. Again, a lot of times people come in, they're like, I know what you're going to tell me. You're telling me I can't have bread and I can't have rice. Or my doctor told me I can't have bread and I can't have rice. And that's like nails on a chalkboard for me. Yes, you can. We just have to count it. It's not the poison, it's the dose. I'll say that repeatedly throughout this presentation. It's not the poison, it's the dose. So how do we count a carbohydrate? We'll see there at the very bottom in the blue box, one carbohydrate serving or one carbohydrate choice, as I like to say, is 15 grams of carbohydrates, okay? Men, y'all typically get to have three to four carbohydrates at each meal and one to two per snack. Ladies, we get about two to three choices with each meal and one to two per snack. So I want you to picture... I should have brought them with me and I apologize for not doing this, but when I teach a patient how to count their carbohydrates, I have poker chips and each chip represents one choice. Um, and then I stack it up in front of them. Okay, breakfast, you have two poker chips. If you want a snack between breakfast and lunch, that's one poker chip. At lunchtime, you get three choices. So you get three poker chips. And I want you to think of it as like a budget. This is your money to spend. And just like money in, in your monetary budget, just because you have it does not mean you have to spend it. But just like a monetary budget, we cannot go over. <laughs> we got to stay on budget. The other thing I get asked, well, what if I save all my breakfast budget and then let it roll over? Doesn't work that way. If we don't use it at that particular time, we lose it. Um, but I highly encourage you to spend at least one carb choice at each mealtime, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I am a huge proponent of snacks. So what is that choice look like? Well, we discussed the different types of carbohydrates that go beyond your breads and rice and pasta with the fruits, the milks, and then of course our sweets. And everything that's listed on here would be considered one choice. So one glass of milk would be one choice. One slice of bread would be considered one choice. Um, a small piece of fruit, about the size of your fist is what we would call a small piece of fruit, would be considered one choice. So as a woman, I get two choices at breakfast time. All right, so breakfast I can have, let's say I'll have a piece of toast and um, a small um, apple to go with breakfast. That doesn't sound like much of a breakfast, but that's just my carbohydrate budget. Proteins and fats always also pay a part in our diet and that's where they come in. I've already spent my carbohydrate budget with my toast and with my small piece of fruit, but I still have fats and proteins that I can have. So I can add an egg to that for some protein. I could add a slice of bacon to that for some fat. Um, I just can't have any more carbohydrates at that meal time. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so what if you don't have a cheat sheet and you're stuck with reading the nutrition labels? I'm gonna show you how to do that. So right here, I have your typical, what your nutrition label looks like. And just for ease of math, we're just gonna look at two things when we're counting our carbohydrates because that's all we're focused on right now. Yes, there's lots of things listed on there, but when we're talking about counting our carbohydrates, there's only two things we have to look at on our nutrition label. The first one is the serving size. Unfortunately, these labels are not for the whole package and I just think that's mean, but we gotta work with what we got. So this particular label is for a half a cup. I don't know what it is, so we'll call it cereal. We'll say this is a half a cup of Cheerios, okay? So for that half a cup of Cheerios, the other thing that you wanna look at is total carbohydrates. That's it. Those are the two things we're looking at when we're counting carbohydrates is serving size and total carbohydrates. Yes, there's dietary fiber. Yes, there's sugar. There's gonna be sugar alcohol, added sugar. There's gonna be all kinds of stuff that's listed underneath total carbohydrate. But the reason why total carbohydrate is big and bold is because that number that's next to it incorporates all the numbers that are listed underneath it. So again, for ease of math, the only thing that we're looking for when we're reading nutrition labels for counting our carbohydrates is the serving size and the total carbohydrates. So we're gonna see who are my math buffs in here. So my half a cup of cereal has 37 grams of carbohydrates. So how many choices would that cost me? Two and a half. Two, yay! I love it. Yay! Exactly. And that's how I want your brain to work when we're looking at counting these carbohydrates. If you want some practice, don't go to the grocery store because that's incredibly overwhelming. Go to your pantry, go to your fridge, 
go to your cupboards, get a Sharpie and look at the stuff that you're already eating. We're just looking at two things, the serving size and the total carbohydrates. And that's how we'll know, is this something that's a really starchy, a really high sugar food? Am I eating a lot of it? Maybe I should make a substitute for that. Or, hey, this is kind of a low sugar option. Maybe I should eat more of this. Just be more aware, be more aware of how much sugar is in the particular things that you're already eating at home before you hit the grocery store. I also have a cheat sheet for you, so you don't have to do the math. That was mean. I know. I'm so sorry, but there's your cheat sheet. Um, and it takes the math out for you. So um, with the 37 grams, if you look at the carb choices or the carbohydrate grams slash choices, it falls between that 36 and two. So it tells you that it's two and a half carb choices. So it does the math for you. But it's really just counting in um, increments of 15. I'll leave that up there. Some people are taking pictures, so we'll just leave that up there for a minute. Yeah. Remind them that you're going to email on the slides. Yes, the slides can be emailed. You, yes, the slides can be emailed to you afterwards. Um, and this is, yeah, I, I should have printed this one out to be honest, because this is a this is a good one to just keep in your pocket for sure. You can pull this out when you're at HEB or Walmart to be like, what was that math again? Um, Obviously, if you're looking at something and the carbohydrates are in the 50s or 60s or even some things that are in the 40s, that better be a sweet treat. That's not something that we want to eat all the time or that's something that's, okay, this is my breakfast, like a bowl of oatmeal that's got some fruit in it or something will probably dance around the that level of carbohydrate. Um, so again, just be very aware of your numbers and this is how we count them. Jen, we have another question from Zoom. How many yes, grams of total carbohydrate per day can a man eat and a woman eat? So total, you're going to want to do, ladies are going to want to do about 30, 60, no, 90. So, I don't like to do it like total in a day because we're trying to break it up throughout the day. So I'd rather say by meal. So ladies, y'all want to have about 30 grams at breakfast, 45 at lunch, 45 at dinner. And if we're going to have snacks, 15. Gentlemen, y'all can have up to 45 at breakfast, um, 60 at lunch, 60 at dinner, and uh, again, 15 at snack time. And this all varies. If you were to go to a dietitian, she would make it more um, compatible to you specifically. This, what I'm giving you is very broad, very general. Um, Thanks. Good answer, thank you. All right, so what's our plate supposed to look like? This is called the plate method. Um, I highly recommend if you want to do a little Google search, you can do myplate.gov um, and it's going to pull up the plate method. And this is what I like to teach my patients as far as trying to rework your brain when it comes to meal time. What should my plate look like? Um, first things first, we need to bring our plates back to nine inches. Um, any Italian food restaurant I feel like you go to gives you those big oval plates with this mountain of pasta. That's not what we're going for. We need to bring our plates back to nine inches because that's a, those would be sensible portions. The other thing too that I want you to envision while we're talking about this is those paper plates um, that have the big well at the bottom and the two small wells at the top. My kids call them happy face plates because that's what it looks like. So that's what I want you to kind of keep in mind while we're going over this is that happy face plate. So when we go to fix our plate, the big well at the bottom of our nine inch plate, typically that's where our entree goes because that's what people are used to doing. What I want you to do is rework your brain and on that bottom happy face, we're gonna fill it with non-starchy vegetables. So what are starchy vegetables? Starchy vegetables would be uh, corn, potatoes, um, peas, and some of your squashes. So non-starchy vegetables, and I have a complete list. We're gonna go over that. Actually, we can go, we'll skip to that real quick. Here's your non-starchy vegetables. I have yet to find somebody that I showed them this list and they didn't find at least one thing that they're like, oh, I can eat that. Um, but these are your non-starchy vegetables. So when you go to fix your plate, half of your plate needs to be these non-starchy vegetables. It doesn't necessarily mean salad. They can be cooked vegetables. A lot of people think that I'm just gonna put you on a salad diet and just make you unhappy for the rest of your life. No, you can do fun <laughs> things with the vegetables that are listed on here. 
These are non-starchy vegetables. Now, I don't call them free foods because some of these vegetables do have carbohydrates in them. However, you would have to eat a massive amount in order for them to affect your blood sugar. The reason being is a lot of these are very high in fiber, which slows the blood sugar spike. So that's why we say go nuts, go crazy on the non-starchy vegetables. There's no serving sizes on there, okay? So going back to our plate method. So we have half of our plate covered. Now we have the two eyeballs at the top. Let's talk about the protein. So on here, we have a piece of, it looks like rotisserie chicken, okay? On your proteins, just for general health sake, we always wanna pick lean, low fat proteins. So that means if we're gonna do beef or pork, trim the marbling off. If we're gonna do chicken or turkey, making sure it's skinless. Um, you can't go wrong with any type of seafood. It's usually how you prepare it where seafood kind of gets you. And then tofu, if you're feeling adventurous, is also gonna go in this area right here. Now, the example I do like to throw out though, is if this chicken had breading on it, that would be considered a carbohydrate choice in which we'd have to count it. If this chicken was covered in barbecue sauce or you were dipping it in honey mustard, that would be a carbohydrate choice that we would have to count. But if you were to eat this chicken just as is, it wouldn't cost you anything out of your carbohydrate budget. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have that piece of chicken. A typical size, a serving size of protein at a meal time, ideally would be about three ounces. That's about the size of the palm of your hand and about as thick as a deck of cards. Can you eat more than that? Yes. Should you? You don't need to. Um, now I always get in big fights with, with my gentlemen uh, patients because they're like, three ounces, that's nothing. Yes, I recognize that you can probably put away an eight ounce steak and good for you. But you're here talking to me. <laughs> so we need to make some changes. So that would be one of the changes um, is making sure that we're doing a sensible, so, sensible size of our proteins, um, making them lean, low fat choices. And then lastly, our carbohydrates, and that's um, just mashed red potatoes. That's right. I'm telling you, you can eat potatoes and you'll live to tell about it. Um, again, <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've budgeted for the potatoes. So we're okay. And that's about this, that's about a one cup serving of potatoes. It's about the size of your fist, we say, is about the size of a cup. So that's a one cup size serving. So in reference to our carbohydrate budget that we talked about earlier, for our ladies, we can have three choices with we'll call this dinner. With gentlemen, y'all can have four choices. If we were to apply our budget to this plate right here, as is, it would only cost us two men and women, it would only cost us two. And it's from the potatoes. The carrots aren't gonna cost you anything. The green beans aren't gonna cost you anything. And the chicken's not gonna cost you anything. So of our budget, ladies three, men four, this is only gonna cost us two. So ladies, we still have one choice left. We can have dressing to dip our chicken in. We can have a sweet treat afterwards. Um, we can have a glass of wine if we wanted to, because we have it in our budget or we don't use it at all, and that's fine too. That's where weight loss comes in. If we're trying to cut our calories, that would be the best way to do it. It's just say that one, just because you have it doesn't mean you have to spend it. Gentlemen, same thing, but y'all get two choices. If y'all want another scoop of mashed potatoes, you could, you could have a bigger scoop of mashed potatoes. Um, if you wanted your chicken to be breaded, that's okay. Just remember though, the more choices that we use, regardless of it being a carbohydrate, a protein or fat, the calories are coming with it. So if we're trying to lose weight, we wanted to cut the calories, that would be one of the ways to do it. Again, just because you have it doesn't mean you have to spend it. Um, we talk about this one? All right. So this just, again, is another handout that kind of helps fill in that happy face plate and it's all on one piece of paper. So I, I talked about all of it, but just again, just to go over it one more time, the non-starchy vegetables is your big smiley face. Your protein is a three ounce portion of lean, low fat protein. Um, and those are your choices there. Oh, I did leave out, I'm glad we went over this. Your peanut butter, your low fat um, cheese or your low fat cottage cheese are also gonna fall in that protein category. So if you're a cottage cheese and fruit eater in the morning, that's one of my favorite breakfasts. The cottage cheese isn't gonna cost you anything but the fruit would count towards your budget. The carbohydrates kind of feel like we've covered those. And then lastly, fats. I do get asked about this a lot of time. What's a healthy fat? What should I use as far as my cooking and all of that stuff goes? Um, healthy 
Mono or polyunsaturated fats are the best way to go for your healthy fats. So that's going to be your avocado oils, your um, canola oils, your olive oils. Those are all going to be considered your healthy oils. Your saturated fats or your pretty um, calorie punched fats are going to be your butter, your bacon. Um, if you cook in coconut oil, please stop doing that. <laughs> that stuff is very high in saturated fat. Um, it's great for your hair though. So don't throw it out, just use it for something else. Um, and then lastly, trans fat. If we go back to the, um, the nutrition label that we went over, trans fat is going to be listed on a nutrition label. We'll say total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat. We always want trans fat to be zero. Trans fat is that one that clogs our arteries and causes heart disease. So anytime trans fat can be zero, we're good to go. And where are we going to find trans fat? Of course, in all of the sweet treats. <laughs> so our donuts, our pie crusts, um, the biscuits, the one that pops, um, cookies and chips. It's usually the, the store-bought stuff. Um, not so much the homemade stuff. Um, and it's just, again, for, um, for to prolong the shelf life, but it has that trans fat in it. All right, buying a better frozen meal. I did this one for my daddy, and I thought it'd be good to share for everybody else. Because um, a lot of times I hear, well, I live alone. So I don't like cooking for, I don't cook for a big group of people or it's just myself and my husband. So I don't like cooking big meals. We're not real big in leftovers. What are some options that I can do out of the frozen food section? These are some um, things that you wanna look at. I'm just gonna pull them all up. These are, <clears throat> these are things that you wanna look at when you're looking in the frozen food section. Luckily, marketing has caught on or the, the frozen food uh, companies have caught on that people are paying more attention to the food that they're putting in their bodies. So they're starting to get a lot better as far as producing foods that aren't so egregious in fat and salt and so on and so forth. Um, but just in case, these are what you want to look for on the labels. So sodium is the big one. And again, because it's a prepackaged food, most prepackaged foods are going to be really high in sodium. And again, that's just to help with the transport and for long shelf life. So when we're looking for um, the sodium level on our frozen food, we want to look for something that's less than 600 uh, milligrams per serving. Fiber is a big, big one. The American diet overall, regardless of age, we're not getting enough fiber. So we want to make sure that if we're buying a frozen meal, let's make sure it's got some fiber in it. And then we want to do less than 450 calories per serving. The reason why, honestly, is most frozen meals are really small and you're going to eat something in addition to that. So let's keep the calories on the frozen meal small. So whatever we add to it, we're not blowing. We're not, it's not a Thanksgiving meal in one sitting. All right. The other things you want to look for just in general when you're looking for a frozen meal is your protein. Does it have some sort of protein source in it? Whole grains. And that's where the fiber comes in. If we're doing whole grain, we're looking for whole wheat pasta, brown rice, whole wheat orzo, some sort of whole grain. And that'll help pick up again with the fiber content. If it has the whole grains, it's going to have that fiber in it. And then, of course, vegetables, because like, we're trying to go for that smiley face. And we want the bulk of our um, calorie intake in one sitting to come from vegetables. So make sure it's got a good source of vegetables in it. Um, I believe that covers everything on the frozen food. So Jim. Yes, ma'am. How do you think the um, simple meals at HEB, I had never really looked at the labels. How do they fare? Because I'm sure a lot of us use those. I love this. I love those. I absolutely love those. I would rather you go get the simple meals than hit up. Um, a drive-through because those were prepared in store. Um, but again, those can be a slippery slope because obviously I would rather you have the meatloaf with green beans and red potatoes than the lobster mac and cheese. Um, they all have food labels on them for you to read, um, which is, and, and they're very clear. And a lot of times you don't even have to go digging. It'll tell you right on the, on the, real big. This is how many calories it has. This is how much fat is in it. This is how much sodium is in it. And you already kind of have a ballpark of what you're trying to stay in. So I would say, honestly, if you're new to reading the simple meals from HEB, look at those numbers first before you even read what the package is, before you even get excited about, oh, lobster ravioli, that sounds really good. Um, read what the numbers are first. Um, the other thing too, that I would caution you with those meal simples, most of them are the label is for one sitting. 
Some of them are not though. So be sure that we're looking again for those two things, the serving size and then the carbohydrates, okay? But I'm a, a huge fan of those meal simples. Snacking. It's okay to snack. It really is. Um, I, you wouldn't want to be around me if I wasn't allowed to have my snacks. Snacks are a healthy part of um, making sure our blood sugar is nice and stable throughout the day. Again, I liken our bodies to a car with carbohydrates being the gasoline. We don't ever want to run on fumes. We want to constantly top off the tank. And that's what we're doing. Um, on top of keeping our blood sugar nice and stable, we're not absolutely ravenous when it comes to mealtime, which I always caution people. We never want to be absolutely ravenous when we come to mealtime. None of this stuff matters. None of the budget, everything I've said, doesn't matter. That smells good. I'm going to eat this table. It doesn't matter. Snacking kind of helps stave all that stuff off. So when we sit down, we're like, yeah, I'm kind of hungry, but I'm not ravenous. But it is something that we need to plan for. If we plan for it, it'll help us eat smaller portions at meal times. It can be a meal replacement. I do hear a lot, well, I'm on the road all the time, or I wake up late, or what, you know, and it just helps um, incorporate healthy eating habits into your already existing lifestyle. Um, it helps keep your blood sugars uh, stable, like I said. You always wanna pair a carbohydrate with a protein. I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second. And then when we're planning on snacking, it helps to plan to eat something every four to six hours. I hear a lot, I'm only really a two meal person. That's totally fine. Or I'm only a one meal person. That's totally fine. Snacks can save you if you plan on eating every four to six hours. Okay, we'll talk about what that looks like. Okay, so here is my snack list. I love this snack list. When I say have a snack, what I want you to do is pair a protein with the carbohydrate. So when you look at this list, you're going to pick one from the blue column and, and one from the green column, and that's your snack. If you stick with the portion sizes, it's actually your one carbohydrate choice, like we were talking about earlier when we're trying to stick on our carbohydrate budget. This would keep you with that one choice for snack time, okay? What I love about this list is um, you can go sweet, you can go savory, you can go big, you can go small. So a lot of times when that four to six hour mark comes up and you're not hungry, but you know you have to eat something, we can uh, totally adjust our snacks for that. We can have a little trail mix. There's a quarter cup of nuts and two tablespoons of raisins. You can have a little trail mix. It's not very much, but you're eating that every four to six hours, like I recommend, and you're topping off that tank. If you're ravenous and you don't have time for a meal, we can go three cups of popcorn and a cheese stick, which is a pretty substantial snack um, until the meal time comes up. But again, this keeps us from not running on fumes, just topping off the tank. And we are going to email you the, the slides so you will have this handout. What about eating out? I get asked this a lot also. I don't cook anymore. Everybody's gone out of my house. I don't cook anymore. What about eating out? Well, here's some do's and don'ts as far as eating out. My little um, graphic on the side, the little fast food menu is a little small, but I will read it to you just so you can, it's comparison sake. So the first thing at the very top on that little graphic is a double cheeseburger. Double cheeseburger has, oh, I can't even read it, 940 calories, 50 grams of carbohydrate, 63 grams of fat, and over 1,200 milligrams of sodium. So needless to say, that's going to blow your budget out of the water, all right? And let me also say, sometimes that happens. There's birthdays, there's anniversaries, there's this is my only option. I understand those things. It's just when we have that happen more than once that it becomes a problem, okay? So if we're making conscientious efforts to even when we go out to eat, making healthy choices, it's gonna require a little homework on our part. So that's why I have, do your homework prior to eating out. We're blessed here in Marble and Burnett and hopefully in Lubbock and wherever else everybody's coming in from that all of our chain restaurants, their information is posted online. Love it or leave it, it's posted online. Um, if it's some place that you go a lot, I have a lot of people every day, I have lunch at Chick-fil-A. Well, that's great. You should know their menu backwards and forwards to include the nutrition information. And that's the homework that I'm talking about. Pull up that nutrition information. Look at what you're eating. Read it like just like you would a label um, in the supermarket. Are you making the most healthy choice 
within your restrictions, your self-imposed restrictions that you can? Um, and if not, what are some of your options? Um, if you're at a restaurant that doesn't have their stuff posted online, what do you do? Um, healthy choices just right off the bat would always be fish, skinless chicken, or sirloin if we're going to for our protein choices. We want to do it baked, baked, broiled, or grilled. Right. Obviously, we don't want to do fried <laughs> or anything doused in cheese. Um, yes, those are good options. If it's a special occasion, go for it. But if this is something that we do pretty regularly, then we need to make healthy choices pretty regularly. Um, try to use your limit your use of sauce, gravings, and dressings. Ask for that stuff on the side. I'm a huge proponent of this. I grew up in the restaurant industry. Thank you, Daddy. That's your money. Ask, get the food prepared how you want it. So if that means asking for the gravies on the side, if that means asking for no butter, if that means asking for special exceptions, do it. It's your money. Um, and it's also your budget. Uh, remember your carbohydrate budget. Remember the plate, the happy face plate, and try to match it as best you can. Eat slowly and undistracted. Again, this is for day to day, not special occasions. Special occasions, it doesn't matter. None of this matters. But eat slowly and undistracted. Don't eat in front of the television. I'm not a fan of people who eat in front of the television. And I'll give you an example as to why. I remember going on a date with my husband in college and we went to an Italian food restaurant and this was back when I had a metabolism and I could eat anything that I wanted. So of course I piled away the pasta and the bread and everything. And then we go to the movies and I am stuffed to the gills, but I smell that popcorn. I'm like, let's just get a small popcorn and we can just snack on it through, you know, just, just throughout the movie, just because it smells so good. And we sit down, the popcorn's gone before the previews are even done because we're distracted because we're watching it. And the next thing you know, you know, you've completely blown your caloric, your caloric budget, much less your, your carbohydrate budget. And that's just because you're distracted. The same thing happens when you sit down with a bag of chips and you're watching a football game. You're not paying attention to how much you're eating with that bag of chips in your hand. If you want to eat chips while you're, eating, while you're watching a football game, just don't take the whole bag. Just take a small portion, take the little lunch kit portions, um, but just don't be distracted. Again, take, eat small portions, share or take it home. Um, back to when you're eating out, if you go to one of those restaurants and you know they have large portions, when you order your food, go ahead and ask for a box and go ahead and immediately box up half of it just to make sure you don't overeat or share it with your girlfriend. And then don't drink your calories. Um, and that's going to segue into alcohol and diabetes. This is another one I get asked quite a bit. Well, does that mean I can't have any of my other liquor or my, uh, my wine? or my beer that I have after work? No, but we do have to budget for it because they are carbohydrates. Um, alcohol can both lower and uh, raise your blood sugar. Um, we can lower it if we're drinking on an empty stomach. That happens to anybody, regardless of whether you have diabetes or not, drinking on an empty stomach is always a bad idea. So you always wanna eat carbohydrates while you're drinking to help keep that blood sugar as stable as you can. Most of the time, high blood sugar happens with alcoholic beverage because of the mixer. So think about vodka and cranberry juice or strawberry daiquiri or a margarita. All those things are very sweet because they have a lot of sugar in them. It's not necessarily the spirits. It's usually the mixers that'll get you as far as um, um, alcoholic beverages affecting your blood sugar. Okay. Um, and then, of course, remembering the general guidelines that women have one drink a day and men have no more than two. And what does that drink look like? Or what is what is considered a drink? A 12 ounce beer, a five ounce glass of wine, white or red, doesn't matter, and a uh, ounce and a half of spirits. It's considered one drink. Okay, we do live in the day and age of apps. So people ask me what apps I recommend. Before I go into this, I will preface, I am not sponsored by any of these apps. Um, these are just the ones that I have found that I like. I will also preface that all of these apps are completely free. So I encourage you to put them on your phone and play with them. Um, and if they're not for you, then take them off. You're not out anything. Of course, they're all gonna say, we have the bonus package or the pro package. They're fine just the way they are. Um, but I do encourage you, if, if you are um, constantly on your phone and apps help you with your day-to-day -day, um, routines, these are the ones that I recommend. Calorie King is the one with the magnifying glass. I love this app because um, if you are 
for my local people. So let's say we go to Super Taco. Their stuff is not going to be listed online. It's just not. So I can pull up Calorie King and I can put in cheese enchilada and it will give me a rough estimate of the calories, the sodium, the carbohydrates, and so on and so forth. It has all of your chains in there as well. So that's a really good resource to have um, if you're at a just a, a mom and pop restaurant and we have several around here. My Net Diary is my absolute favorite one. Um, if I had to pick one of the four, My Net Diary is my absolute favorite. I'm pretty sure some Texas girls put that together because in the food log, you'll find Bucky's products. You will find HEB products. You will find Whataburger products. So tell me some Texas girls didn't put that together. But My Net Diary is a great kind of all-in-one shop as far as logging your food um, and they giving you a rough estimate of the calories, proteins, fats, so on and so forth. It can go into detail too, as far as fiber, um, any of the vitamins and minerals that you might have a deficiency in, it can help you monitor that. It's a good place to log, um, it helps you log your, your water intake, your exercise. Um, and what's great about it too, is each day you start with an apple. That's why it has the apple. You start with an apple that's green. And every time you log some food, the apple kind of whittles away a little bit. And if you go over your target, your apple turns red. Um, so the more green apples you get, you know, your graph stays nice and green. And if you have a couple of red apples, and who doesn't? But if you have a couple of red apples, then your graph turns red. But it's a, it's a fun little way to, um, what I encourage people is if we're going to do my net diary, to only do it for about two weeks. Um, some people get a little obsessive about the numbers and that's we're losing focus as to why we started in the first place. And the real reason why we want to do something like that is to establish what our habits are. We might even be aware of like, man, yeah, I drink a lot of water. And then I log it. I'm like, no, I really don't. I just had one container of water or I drink three meals, three meals a day. And then I go to log it. I'm like, man, I really don't eat three meals a day or I'm not getting enough calories or I'm not getting enough fiber. It's a good way to identify those habits, good or bad. Um, but I wouldn't do it more than two weeks because then we kind of borderline on obsessing about the numbers rather than the lifestyle changes. My sugar is specifically for diabetics. Um, it's very similar to um, my net diary. It is misspelled on purpose, but my sugar does pretty much everything my net diary does. Um, but you can also, depending on your phone, uh, link it to your glucose meter. So it's another place to log all of your um, glucose readings when you stick your fingers. Um, uh, and it can give you kind of a, we'll guess the next time you go to your doctor that your A1C is going to be this level. So that's a good one. And then lastly, my fitness pal, this one seems to be the most popular um, when people come in and say, well, I've been tracking it. This is one that they use. It's a good one for suggesting workouts, for logging food. I'm not in love with the accuracy of its um, food database and the information that it gives. But again, if what we're using it for is just to establish um, habits um, and, and see if there's something that we need to work on. So that's a good place to at least monitor habits for sure. Okay. And I believe that is it. So any questions, comments, concerns regarding diabetes and prediabetes? Okay, so just because we have our email on your form, does that mean we will automatically get the email or do we have to somehow, in addition to its being there, request it? If we have your email on this form, I believe it will be sent to you. Yes, okay, the, the slides will. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, all the emails are on here. Okay. So okay. you might want to just check before you go that it's accurate. Yes. I did realize when we were talking about um, the blood sugar levels and the finger sticks um, that I completely didn't. I, I went, in on A1C and I didn't talk about the finger sticks and that's I'm very passionate about that because it drives me crazy when people come in and they're like yeah I stick my finger but I don't know what that number means like you're you're sticking yourself you should know what that number means so <laughs> when you stick your finger to check your blood sugar level first of all you always want to do the side of your finger not the pads of your finger um, mainly so you can still use the pads of your finger, but there's also a blood vessel that runs down the middle. And if you were to stick that, then the unlikely event that you stick that, it's going to be a geyser. So to just make things a lot easier, you want to do the side. Um, sides of your finger tend to be a little bit rougher anyway, so it doesn't 
hurt as much. Um, but when we're taking that reading, a normal glucose reading, it varies from you know hospital, doctor's office, whatever, but a normal glucose reading would be somewhere between 80 and 110. If you've been diagnosed with diabetes, our goals for you is fasting when you wake up and you test your blood sugar before you eat anything. We want that number to be less than 130. And then when you eat a meal, we want you to check your um, blood sugar an hour to two hours after eating, and we would want that number to be less than 180. So that's what those numbers mean. Um, as far as bottoming out or having an episode of um, high blood sugar or hyperglycemia, typically with pre-diabetics -diabe and um, type 2 diabetics, they don't bottom out. They don't have hyperglycemia too much. It's usually the other direction that they have issues with. And what I would consider hyperglycemia is anything over 300 for consecutive days. Um, if you are checking your blood sugar and you're noticing it's over 300 and you don't really know why, um, let's first think about the diet. Did I house a cake by myself or a pint of ice cream by myself? And that's probably why it's high. Um, but if there's no reason, there's no real reason that it would be that high, drink a glass of water and go for a walk. Remember I said exercise is our body's natural way of bringing that blood sugar down. So go for a walk for about 30 minutes and recheck it. If it's not coming down, again, record it. If it happens again the next day, we need to give our doctor a call. Because a lot of times too, um, one of the ind indicators of um, infection or illness within diabetics is a high blood sugar. Even though you're following your diet to a T, you're taking your medication to a T, but your blood sugar is still high. It also might be indicative of we need to adjust your medication because what we're doing is not working anymore. So we're gonna have to rearrange some things to find something that better manages your hyper, um, hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia, that varies. Um, I have had a couple type two patients that have bottom out. I had one bottom out in my office. That was terrifying. Um, but, and that varies from person to person. I've had some of my patients say that they can feel the shakes at 70, which is still kind of sort of dancing around normal, but they swear they can feel the sh shakes at 70. Typically, we'll say it's 60 or below is considered low blood sugar. So in the event that um, if you are the diabetic or you're taking care of someone who's diabetic and they're showing signs of hypoglycemia, and as crass as it sounds, the best way I can liken the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, low blood, blood sugar, is they act kind of like they're drunk. Um, they're, they're slurring their words. It doesn't really make sense. They can't walk real straight. They're real tired. Um, check their blood sugar. I'm oh, sorry. Shaky. And they're shaky. Yes. A lot of times they're shaky. Uh, most of my diabetics can tell me I, I can feel it. I, I can feel it going low. If you or someone that you're taking care of is expressing those thoughts, we need to get orange juice um, and we need to test our blood sugar every 15 minutes. If it's not coming back up after a glass of orange juice or a Coke, I even had one lady that carried around those little, it was so cute. Um, the frosting that comes in the little pipings that you do like decorative stuff on cakes. She carried that in her purse because um, her husband said it was just easier to squirt that in her mouth than trying to get her to drink orange juice whenever she was having episodes of low blood sugar. So it's really, it depends on your preference. They do make products of glucose tablets. Um, they don't taste that great, uh, but it's whatever you can get yourself or the person that you're taking care of to take in that instance when they're, they're really not all together. Um, and then constantly checking their blood sugar every 15 minutes. If it's not coming up, we need to go to the emergency room because something's up and it's out of our hands. We've tried everything in our toolkit and that's not working. So we need to go seek some um, medical help. Okay. Uh, Ted, you have a yeah. Yeah. Do you have a do you have a question, Ted, or are you just stretching? He took his microphone off. Oh, he did. Yeah. I mean, his earphone. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna say Ted's good. <laughs> He's had it. Yes. Um. There. Everyone's good. Everyone's good. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? I just want to say that from everything you said, your dad sounds like a great guy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and modest. <laughs> so you mentioned the sizes of plates. Yes. How they've changed over the years. Yes. So recently had an occasion to um, find some, some little bowls and plates from the 70s because we were celebrating a big anniversary. And I found some, some antique stores and compared them 
to what oh yeah what we eat on all the time oh, and yeah. it's a huge difference oh or, yeah or like as some of you have your mother's china or something like mm -hmm. that it's just it's just amazing yeah uh, yeah what the difference is and and you put your food on your plate and you think oh <laughs> that's not much but it's because the plate is so big right absolutely absolutely my son is uh very much an athlete so he eats every 15 minutes um, it's constant and we went to breakfast and he ordered a small orange juice and they brought out the little four ounce glass of orange juice and he's like I'm going to drink this before she walks away from the table and I'm like well that's what normal people drink darling it's you don't have to drink 32 ounces of orange juice it's just that's all you need that's that's the proper serving size of orange juice so again it's not the poison it's the dose well, thanks, Jen. You did a great job. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Everyone have a great day.